dear guests, dear students of the TU Berlin, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our event on tackling the climate crisis and delivering environmental justice on the international stage. My name is Sophia Becker. I'm the Vice President for Sustainability at the TU Berlin. And I'm very honored today to welcome Mr. Regan. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> um, the leader of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Mr. Regan was sworn in as the 16th administrator of the EPA in March 20, uh, 2021, so about a year ago. <laughs> um, and Administer Regan is a graduate of the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, making him the first EPA administrator to have graduated from a historically black college and university. He also holds a master's degree in public administration from the George Washington University. And today, what we have prepared, prepared for you um, together with the US Embassy is that Mr. Regan will first give an opening talk to us, and that will be followed by an interactive Q&A session with you, our curious, smart, and engaged students. So thank you very much for being here as well today. And my colleague, Kaya Prill, uh, our coordinator for climate protection and sustainability at the TU Berlin will moderate the session. So personally, I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Regan, today for be here and join us, visit us at the TU Berlin. However, um, before we start with our program today on environmental justice and environmental issues, I feel the need to address the recent violent events that have taken place. Yesterday, there has been an atrocious shooting at a school in Texas where many innocent young children um, have died. And there is still an atrocious war going on against the Ukraine right next to us here in Europe. And to commemorate all victims of such awful violence, I ask you all to stand up for a minute of silence with us together. Thank you very much. And with this, I hand over to Michael Regan and thank you very much for your participation. Also, please don't forget to think about the questions you might have in your head so that we have a lively discussion afterwards. Thank you. Mr. Regan, please. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here today, and I'm also thankful, um, Ms. Becker, for the moment of silence. You know, we bring children into this world expecting to watch them grow up and lead big, beautiful lives of their own. And today, 19 families will never have that chance, and those families will never be the same. Uh, most of us are heartbroken. And like President Biden, I'm also angry and frustrated that unnecessary gun violence continues to plague the United States of America. So thank you for that moment of silence and that acknowledgement. Today I'm here to speak with you all about our work in the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the global challenges that we all face working to address, and I'm glad to be here. And I thank you for your understanding that this is a tough day for all of us with the backdrop of Ukraine and the state of Texas. But I also know that you all care a great deal about climate change and our environment. That's why it's truly a highlight for me to be here today. This is the highlight of my trip. 
Speaking with young people always fills me with optimism about our world, bright ideas, innovation, entrepreneurship. So thank you all for being here. Throughout our history, young people have always been at the forefront of any big movement or change, the tip of the spear, and the environmental movement is no exception. The very first Earth Day in 1970 was led by students and grassroots activists who envisioned a healthier world where all people could thrive. Today is no different. All over the world, your generation is fighting for a healthier, more just tomorrow. It's your generation that's sounding the alarm, grabbing the attention of those of us in power and sparking the global conversation, not only about the urgency of climate change, but the kind of world that we fundamentally want to create to leave to future generations. I wanna recognize that as we gather here today, and as has been discussed, millions of people in Ukraine, many people your age, are standing up against the unjust and unprovoked war, a war that has created millions of refugees, has stolen untold lives, and that has tried to uproot the very foundation of democracy. But as President Biden has said, liberty, democracy, and human dignity, these are all forces that are far more powerful than fear and oppression. And the contest, and in a contest between democracy and autocracy, between sovereignty and subjugation, make no mistake, freedom will always win. Together, with the help of our allies, the United States of America will continue to support the people of Ukraine through economic security and humanitarian assistance. The United States Environmental Protection Agency is also prepared to help rebuild the country's environmental infrastructure, just as we did for the Soviet bloc nations 30 years ago. We are actively engaged in efforts with the State Department to support the Ukrainian government in the future of their environmental recovery. The fight to preserve democracy is bound to the fight for a livable planet. We cannot be for one without the other. Democracy is about respecting what U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt called essential human freedoms. Against the backdrop of World War II and, the, and America's looming involvement in the war, President FDR delivered what became known as the Four Freedoms Speech. He described four basic rights that should belong to all people everywhere. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. Freedom from want includes the right to live without the risk of environmental hazard or harm. I know that many of you here today are fighting for this very principle. The idea that all people, regardless of race, how much money they have in their pockets, or the country or community that they live in deserve to live in a healthy and safe environment. And that's really the essence and the heart of the movement for climate action. It's about building a more inclusive, more just, and more equitable world. That's something that your generation understands inherently, and I believe it's the most important lesson for anyone living today to learn. Creating a future by which all people are treated with dignity and respect and compassion, well, that's what's guiding the work at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. In addition to my role as EP administrator, I'm also the proud parent of an eight-year-old son, Matthew. And I think about his future every single minute of the day. It's a great personal motivator for me. It's what drives me to work harder than I did the day before and to do everything in my power to create a brighter future for my son and every other child in this world. And that's why I'm grateful to President Biden that he shares this same commitment. One of his first actions as president was directing his leadership team to embed climate action into every single aspect of our decision making. And that's exactly what we've done at EPA, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. We are le leaving no stone unturned. So far, we've issued the most ambitious greenhouse gas emission standards for cars and trucks in United States history. These standards will avoid more than 3 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. 
We've issued a final rule to phase down the production and the consumption of climate damaging hydrofluorocarbons by 85% over the next 15 years. We propose a new rule to reduce 41 million tons of methane pollution from the oil and natural gas industry. And we're taking action to tackle a full array of threats that power plants pose to clean for clean air, safe water, and healthy land. And those are just a few ways that EPA is working to confront the climate crisis. Our sister agencies like the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Defense, and others are working towards those very same climate goals. And in everything we do at EPA, we are prioritizing the most vulnerable people amongst us, the communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis, the communities who consistently bear a higher burden of pollution, who have the least resources to, to prepare for or recover from climate disasters. In the United States, we refer to these folks as climate justice communities. And at the EPA, environmental justice has become our North Star. So we've been hard at work to restore America's leadership on the climate stage, both at home and abroad. That's why conferences like the G7, which I'll be attending, the reason that I'm here in Berlin, that's why they matter. Because a crisis of this scale and scope requires that all of us work together as partners and recognize that our fates are intertwined. There's no question that we have a lot more work to do ahead of us. We've only begun to scratch the circus, surface. But so much of what we've achieved is because of you, because of the spotlight that your generation has helped put on the climate crisis, because the pressure, because of the pressure that you've applied to leaders like myself. So I want you to always remember how vital your role is in creating and demanding a better world. We have a lot of work ahead of us, and I think it's only fair that we be honest and say that we need you. We need every single one of you. We need you now, and we need you for the long haul. We need your courage and your compassion, your sense of justice and ambition. We have to get this right, and the voices of young people, your voices, will be important to ensure that we do just that. There's no doubt that the actions that we're taking today as a global society will have lasting consequences well beyond your generation. So it's important that we're here today having this conversation. And it's important that I say, us old folks, we see you, we hear you, we are listening, and we will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiegand, for your lecture today, and thank you for your really important words uh, to the students that are here today. Thank you. You already mentioned uh, the, situa uh, the situation in Ukraine, and uh, we all know that uh, um, electricity or energy we have today is a big climate problem. And in the discussion about the uh, energy situation, I had the feeling that we speak a lot um, about how we can um, get the energy from other sources, but we haven't spoken so much about how can we uh, use less energy. What do you think to this? Do you have the same uh, thoughts? And uh, yeah. I do. I think that we have to continually think about how we use energy more efficiently. Yeah. Obviously, if we are going to electrify our transportation sector, electric vehicles will require some level of power. And so I believe that globally we need to continue to invest in clean energy alternatives. In the United States of America last year, 80 percent of all new investments in capacity was in renewable energy and battery storage. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, if we had adopted this attitude as a global society 10 years ago and invested in clean energy, we would not have to rely on fossil fuels the way we're having to rely on them today. And we would not see some of the impacts that we're seeing in the global market because of this unprovoked war by Russia. Uh, so it's important that while we feel some of the gaps right now with fossil fuels, 
that we not take our eyes off the ball and continue to invest in clean energy so that we can not only have a livable planet, but that we can ensure that our countries have the national security that we need. Yeah. I can't say any <laughs> more to this. Thank you. I would like to uh, open for your questions. So if you have a question, please raise up. And um, we would like to know what's your name and what's your study program. Um, and then we would like to hear your question. Yeah, we have some uh, microphones. I would like to get the person in yellow here in the front. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, you can hear me. Great. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for uh, being here and for giving us the space to ask questions as well. Uh, so I was wondering, um, this question may be more relevant maybe later in the discussion, but I figured I'd just take the chance. Uh, so we <coughs> assume that the, the crisis that we're currently facing is most likely due to um, well, exploitation of, of, of resources, of over-exploitation for profit. And I was wondering that the approach that I often feel like is the general approach right now is to look for different methods. As you mentioned, for example, that uh, less uh, carbon emission for cars, for example, with switching to electric cars, um, which sounds nice, but I was wondering if the EPA willing to question if uh, the reason these methods were created in the first place and the reason we have such exploitative methods is not necessarily because we just happen to land on exploitative methods, but because those methods, any exploitative methods are generally favored by our system. I mean, just for example, you right now at the um, interview, we asked you if, if you think it's important to use less energy, and you answered with uh, that it's important to use energy more efficient, which is not necessarily less. So I was wondering if, if the EPA also approaches that or if it's really just the focus of shifting our attention, if that makes sense. I hope that makes it does. Sense. It does. No, I, I think you, you raise a very good point, and I, I think we have to do both. I, I think that for those um, of us and those businesses, those entities, those organizations that can use less energy, that is absolutely the best course of action. Uh, I think for those who cannot use as little as we would like, we need for it to be much more efficient. I'm sure in Germany, just like in the United States, in some of our rural communities, we don't have options where some of our farmers and some of our intense industries that need transportation can go without. But in some of our urban areas, obviously, if we can go without having cars and we can use uh, you know, public transportation, especially if that's a clean form of transportation, uh, that is the best solution. So, we really need to have sustainable solutions that will work for society and help society continue to move forward. And I think that there are a number of choices that we can make as individuals, uh, as governments, um, as organizations uh, that can fit the bill uh, to continue to be globally competitive, create jobs, uh, really leverage advanced technologies, um, without completely uh, re re resulting to life won't be as good. Uh, life can be better with clean energy technologies and using less energy. We just need to have some options. I have a wider question to this. So I think um, the image of uh, climate protection at the moment is really focused on you can't do this, you can't do that. and. It's not uh, what you said, that we have like a positive future. We all want to go to it. So yes. few of us and hopefully a lot of the people who are here today. But I would say we, like as a whole world, don't have this. What can we do to get the whole world, all people, to this positive mindset, like that it's good to uh, protect the climate for the positive future uh, we are going to? I think that's exactly right. I believe that protecting the planet and mitigating the climate crisis is just as much as an opportunity as it is a sacrifice. Um, when I think about 
uh, your generation and how you all use technology. Um, we, we think about like the clean energy platform. I think about it like an iPhone. When the iPhone was created, no one had any idea how many apps would be created and apps are continually being created. I think that we need to have uh, uh, an energy infrastructure that's as smart as the internet or as smart as an iPhone. And I believe wind, solar, solar and battery storage are just the beginning. I think your generation is gonna create modes of energy generation or efficiency or business models that incentivize not using energy in ways that none of us have ever thought about. I think there are business models out there. I think there is technology out there. I think the sky's the limit. And so if we can imagine a clean energy future where we're not reliant on fossil fuels, but motivated by technology and new jobs, cleaner air, cleaner water, healthier people, no environmental justice communities. All of this is the future and it will be a future that you all usher in. Thank you. I saw some uh, questions over there. Yeah, there's a person uh, in blue. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lasse. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute for Rail Infrastructure. And I got a question I'm a bit disappointed about. Um, that's the infrastructure. Because when we are comparing transportation methods, we are also, uh, always taking just the exhaust into account. We are not talking about how was the infrastructure built. So for example, planes just need and uh, ports, also ships, and we have the roads and uh, rail infrastructure. We are not talking about um, how they were built. And um, this causes into no recycling of uh, concrete, for example. So we have no circular economy in that. And um, yeah, my, I'm curious about your feelings about that and maybe what you're doing in the US uh, in this topic. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for that question. And, you know, your question is very timely. Uh, during our ministerial meetings for the rest of the week for uh, focused on, on G7 solutions, the circular economy and recycling is going to be a significant part of our conversations. Uh, just last November, EPA released uh, uh, a recycling roadmap, a recycling strategy. Uh, this is something that we're really excited about. Um, I have to say, if I, as I travel internationally and domestically, just below climate change, uh, your generation, younger people are most excited about getting rid of plastics and, and investing in a circular economy. Uh, this is an area where the United States government has lagged a little bit and we're playing a little bit of catch up. The last four years, we had a different leadership in place that really didn't believe in the environment and respecting your fellow man and the planet. Now with Joe Biden, we do. A circular economy is very important. Following the science and following the law is very important. So in, in the United States, um, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Uh, the president uh, under his leadership passed a $1.3 trillion bill to invest in the United States infrastructure. And as we think about our roads, our bridges, our wastewater treatment facilities, um, we're thinking about uh, the implications for recycling, investing in a way where the infrastructure is climate resilient, not necessarily having all of our roads and bridges uh, unjustly go through communities that don't have political representation or are low income. And so we're thinking about environmental justice as well. So all of the metrics that you're talking about are so important and they are a part of our international and global conversations, but they are also very central to the conversations that we're having with the President of the United States. So you just mentioned like the different or some of the fields like you work as EPA on. And I have the feeling that in the discussion, we reduce a lot of the problems on emissions. And there are also problems like you can't 
transfer to emissions. What do you think about it? Like water pollution, air pollution, often don't get this big stage like um, CO2 emissions. Um, do you think this is like good or do you think it's bad? And what can we do um, to focus uh, more uh, different topics? I, I think we have to, number one, embrace the fact that most people are accepting climate change is real and it's an existential threat to society. But as we talk about solving the climate crisis to the point you're making, I believe that we have to have a more complex conversation about the co-benefits. Mm -hmm. If we don't want to have coal-fired power plants uh, in the world and we want to shut them down because of the CO2 footprint, we should also be looking at the health and economic benefits mm -hmm. of not having the discharge into our streams and our river and the waste handling uh, and handling waste like coal ash. There are so many benefits. Uh, we also get the reduction of uh, PM 2.5 and NOx, which we know exacerbate Uh, respiratory illnesses, um, blood pressure, and the like, cardiovascular. So as we talk about these climate solutions, um, and as we think about methane, if we, we reduce methane from the oil and gas sector, mm -hmm. we also have to be mindful of those volatile organic chemicals that we're reducing as well. We can't forget that while we're saving the planet, we have to continue saving people as well. Mm -hmm. And so I believe we can do both. And I do agree with you that our conversations should be a little bit more complex and layered because we should recognize that while we're saving the planet and reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, we are really cleaning up our air and our water. Yeah. So I would like, ah, I see uh, over there in the uh, white t-shirt, another question um, on top, over there. Could you maybe raise up again? Yeah, like. Well, hello, and thanks also for coming. I have maybe a bit more direct question. Um, you mentioned that it's very important to invest a lot of money in sustainable energy sources, but I'm wondering how can it be that there's still each year about $20 billion dollars invested directly or direct subsidies in the fossil fuels in the US? So maybe can you explain how this still can be the status quo while we are mentioning that sustainability or sustainable energy sources are um, getting much more important in the coming years? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And the, the, the immediate answer is, you, you know, we didn't get in this problem overnight and we're not going to get out of it overnight. And we're seeing shifts, in, entire shifts in markets. And so what's happening in addition to technologies becoming more cost effective, uh, the market, you all being much smarter and demanding cleaner energy, Uh, we're also seeing downward pressure from insurance companies who are saying we're no longer going to provide insurance to fossil fuel companies that build coal-fired power plants. Um, we're seeing investors on Wall Street and other places say we no longer want carbon intensive operations in our investment portfolios. So what we want to see is we want to see a very quick shift to clean energy, but we want that shift to be sustainable and not totally dependent on who's in power politically. And in order to do that, you have to have a convergence of a lot of different policy shifts. And I believe that's what we're seeing at a record pace. Uh, I agree with you 100% that right now we still have too much money being invested in fossil fuels. Um, but I also know that with the pressure that your generation is putting on all elected officials, both direct pressure by voting, but also direct pressure in terms of how you spend your money and what you demand. Uh, over the next four to five years, we're going to see record level shifts globally towards a clean energy future. And I think that's the kind of sustained change we need to see. Thank you for the answer. Um, could I get the women in blue, yellow? Hi, 
Hi, my name is Rosalie Royce. I'm a master's student in energy management here at the Technical University of Berlin, though I'm originally American as well, <laughs> uh, from Colorado. Ah, yes. Um, so nice to see a fellow American here. <laughs> and actually, your last answer uh, touched on a couple of points that I would like to dig into a little bit further, and that is... In the previous administration, we didn't see a lot of leadership from the U.S. on climate issues, and um, really what that meant is a lot of the kind of climate topics in the U.S. fell to corporations, which was driven by very capitalistic tendencies, if you will. And we see this kind of optimization through capitalism at a global scale to reduce carbon emissions in the cheapest way possible, right? And that often means that we see corporations going to developing countries to try and mitigate their emissions. So, for example, if you're trying to do a carbon offset project, you would have trees planted in, for example, Uganda is um, a really common place for there to be these kind of projects. So I'm just curious how the EPA and the U.S. government as a whole is thinking about environmental and climate justice, not just within the U.S., but also how it's being outsourced to developing countries as well, and potentially the externalities of these projects, such as um, like taking over farmland for tree planting and um, you know, making it harder for local communities to actually earn livings because these large corporations are able to spend lots of money to develop carbon mitigation projects. So just kind of the global context of mm -hmm. what the EPA thinks about and is doing to protect communities outside the U.S. as well as inside the U.S. I think that's a very important question. And to be blunt, there, there was no leadership during the previous administration. So we lost four years. Um, the president declared on day one that America was back and we actually do believe in science and we want to follow the law. And he required that we have a whole of government approach as we think about climate mitigation. So that means I'm spending a lot of time on the phone conversing with the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Labor, of Commerce, of, of Housing and Urban Development. And we, we do think about uh, most of what we do uh, in terms of domestic leadership. And environmental justice is central to that. So we're trying to make sure that we clean up our own house first before we processize all across the world. But at the same time, we all recognize that we are connected globally. And so we're seeing that ripple effect. These um, carbon accounting schemes won't stand up to the future test of scrutiny. I think the markets, um, technology, uh, best um, available business practices, all of them are going to demand a much more rigorous accounting and reduction scheme for carbon as carbon is becoming monetized. And so we want to really look at this through the lens of starting with justice and equity and fairness. We have too many environmental justice communities, not only located in, in the United States, but globally. So as we think about our solutions, we have to think about equity from the very beginning. I believe that we're gonna to have to integrate equity and justice into our policies and regulations so that we get that baseline in policy and regulations, but that it forces the markets to be much more fairer to those who have been disproportionately impacted over longer periods of time. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think we have the same question in Germany as well at the moment, and it's yeah not easy to answer. Uh, I would like to get the women in black over here in the front row, like the fourth row. Yes, please. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm also a fellow American from Minnesota. <laughs> My name is Mary. I work at the Berlin Climate Policy Think Tank, Adelphi, and I lead the Transatlantic Climate Bridge, which is a climate diplomacy initiative of the German federal government. Um, as you head into the G7 ministerial meeting, um, I'm interested to turn this conversation a bit to international climate cooperation. So a huge priority of Chancellor Schultz and Germany right now in general is the idea of a climate club. 
And I was wondering if uh, the EPA has any ideas on how they would like to see such a club um, be structured or designed, and if you have an idea of how such a format in the international climate policy landscape, in addition to bringing about significant mitigation, which is its primary goal, uh, could also be a vehicle for climate justice. I, you know, it's a great question. And <clears throat> the, the, the first thing I would say is, uh, I believe if, if we do continue to coalesce around the ideas of a group or club, that we continue to effectively produce challenges like the methane challenge that we're seeing globally. Uh, so many countries have signed up for and decided that they will meet the methane pledge, uh, something that we have to tackle as a global society. I, I think it's, it, it's extremely important that we continue to um, have uh, a, a, a very honest and transparent exchange around technology and technology development. There's a lot of intellectual capacity and capital that our countries could share to really have these breakout moments. And if we could funnel or cost share some of the research and development and then share that intellectual capacity, uh, we could really see the world take off. Uh, so it's, it's great to be competitive. And, and I think most countries will want to retain some of that competitive nature and posture. But, but, but this is an issue that really brings countries together like no other issues. Climate, the climate crisis is not only a, a planetary issue and a public health issue, but as we're seeing with the war in Ukraine, it's a, it's a national security issue. So there's so many interests that converge right about now. And I think our countries need to think about it in that more complex way. So we need to have more methane challenges. Um, those work. We need to have uh, continued exchanges of intellectual ca uh, uh, capacity around research and development and joint investment ventures. Um, and, and we need to continue to, to think about this issue in, in the way that a, a, a member of the audience asked earlier, which is, are we quantifying the climate benefits, the public health benefits, the economic benefits. And, and by the way, everything that we do moving forward and technology gives us the ability to do this like never before, it should be done in a fair and just and equitable way. Thank you. I think it's really important that we learn from each other um, as countries. Uh, what's working in the US could maybe also work here and yes. in other countries. Um, I would like to get um, the man in blue over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, first of all, nice to meet you, Mr. Reagan. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Adrian, and I'm currently studying business engineering. Um, and my question is if you could elaborate on the Volkswagen monitorship you had regarding the diesel scandal and what role the EPA or if the EPA even played a role um, concerning this incident? You know, the EPA played a, a very pivotal role in, in catching the scheme. And, you know, I think the sophistication of the EPA, uh, both from a technological standpoint and our policies and our regulatory scheme, were, were able to understand what was happening with emissions from the automobile sector and then identify those who were cheating and cheating big. Volkswagen obviously got caught, uh, got its hand caught in the cookie jar and has, has paid very handsomely. And I think with those billions of dollars that Volkswagen has been forced to pay, uh, those resources are being invested in cleaner technologies, uh, better business practices, uh, ways that communities can, can benefit from them the most. So I would argue that EPA played a lead role in identifying the problem and then partnered with our Department of Justice to bring the polluters, uh, make, them, make them pay. And, and they did pay very handsomely and we're all benefiting from that. Thank you. Um, I would like to take the man on top in the blue shirt. Yeah.
Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my name is Janus, and I study mechanical engineering here at the university. Um, my question was uh, about uh, companies, big companies, um, about the regulation that the EPA uh, wants to implement or is planning on Im implementing. Um, is it uh, is the EPA strategy more directed towards uh, harshly regulating, um, t taking more control, or trying to take more control over operations and businesses, or um, does it want to let businesses go more freely and kind of hope for them to adjust to more um, renewable resources because it's um, because as they become more competitively, uh, I guess, valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, I would I would say that um, you know my, my my philosophy is <clears throat> it's our job as the regulator to create rules of engagement, to set expectations, but put rules in play that also provide companies a certain level of certainty so that they can make longer term investments. And <clears throat> most people say. EPA regulates businesses, and that's one way to describe it. Uh, the other way to describe it is our regulations actually are technology standards. So we evaluate what technologies are available, and we evaluate the cost associated with acquiring those technologies. We also evaluate the benefits of those technologies to the environment and public health. Mix all that together, and then we put that regulation out there. And what it should do is protect the planet, protect people, and provide businesses with a roadmap on what technologies are available and which ones are cost effective. Um, I, I don't believe that um, regulations have to be viewed as overly burdensome. Um, I, I think as long as the process plays out in a way where both the industry and our environmental community and our communities that have been disproportionately impacted have a seat at the table as we're developing the regulations, we can put forward some really aggressive and stringent regulations that are achievable by the companies. Uh, I can say that in the past year since President Biden has been in office, we have put out the most stringent greenhouse gas rule that the transportation has, sector has ever seen. But when we did that, the unions were at the table. Uh, big auto companies like GM and Stellantis and Ford were at the table. And so even though it's the most stringent and aggressive regulation in United States history, it was done in a way that we know that the automobile uh, sector can reach those goals. The same thing, we're doing the same thing with the oil and gas sector. As we think about regulating methane, we are taking into account that there is so much technology that can identify these leaks, um, but also identify the lost product. The, the methane gas that's just leaking out is valuable. We've got a rule that we put in place that demonstrates you can save, the industry would save hundreds of millions of dollars by doing better at detecting the leaks. We also know that the industry can reduce significant tons of methane by identifying these leaks. The way we're going about this rule is we are engaging with any and everybody that has any thoughts about technology. And now in that regulation, whether it's an autonomous robotic dog that can be operated from 100 miles away that can detect these leaks or leveraging satellite technology in space, companies now have the ability to use all of this to collect data to do a better job of capturing that product and reducing those emissions. So when I think about regulations, especially in 2022 and beyond, I think about them as technology standards. We have way more technology and data at our fingertips than we've ever had in society. And if we use it correctly, we can save the planet, we can be globally competitive, and we can protect public health, especially those communities that are most vulnerable. So I think uh, we will have time now for one quick question and one quick answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to take uh, the person, I think in white over there. Could you maybe stand up? Yes, yes. Hi. 
thank you for taking my question. So my name is Maxim, and I do uh, electrical engineering. And one question is that we know that, uh, let's say, economic growth uh, and CO2 emissions are quite linked together. And so one question is, do you have some strat uh, strategies maybe to limit economic growth? And have you thought about that? And I mean, is it something uh, that may be possible or not? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think when we think about uh, this in the traditional sense, um, economic growth and carbon emissions are linked. But, but because technology is so valuable and because we're seeing such a shift in human behavioral changes, we're seeing shifts in the markets, I believe that we can de-link economic growth and carbon intensity in ways that we've never been able to do it before. Uh, a big part of that is because of the way your generation lives and operates and what, what is demanded. Uh, younger people are buying smaller houses if they purchase homes. Uh, younger people are not purchasing cars at the same rate. Uh, younger people are more educated on the products that they purchase, uh, the, su the supply chain impacts, the, the level of sustainability of of the companies. Companies are changing the way they think about producing products in ways that, quite frankly, no regulation or policy could ever force. It is because of the demand in the market that you all possess. And so I, I do believe that, uh, again, society can continue to progress and do extremely well uh, because of a significant behavioral technological and attitudinal shift that we're seeing with younger generations. It's about opportunity and less about sacrifice. Okay, and now to um, end um, the event today. Um, you already started in your speech to empower the students that are here today. And uh, we would like to know, is there one main tip on climate justice you want to give the audience today? I, I believe that um, number one, thank you all for, for being here and thank you for the questions and thank you for the pressure and the demands that you're placing on your leaders. Um, I think that you have to continue to do that. And no matter what profession you choose or what discipline you choose, uh, I think as you perfect your craft and continue to get your educational experience, if you can remember to keep fairness and equity at the core of all of these decisions, then I believe that it will serve as a rising tide and we can lift all of society at the same time. Uh, I believe that when we think about disparities, environmental justice, racism, uh, I believe that you all represent a generation that understands this much better than any generation we've seen. And so if you can if infuse that morality into every single thing that you're doing, I believe that a lot of the disparities that we've seen in the past, we won't see moving forward because of your leadership. So I would just ask that as you think about making this world a better place, think about the impact of fairness, equity, and justice. And if it's infused in the beginning, it'll serve as a rising tide and everybody will benefit from it. Thank you very much for your words. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiegand, that you've been here today with us. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to um, answer them all, but thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we wish you a nice evening now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.